little microwave. And I have a microwave one too, but I've just never broken it out and used it. Have you used yours? Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, this will be great to have. I can get samples. I can do this. It's still stuffed in the in the garage somewhere. The mm -hmm. surface inside is only like three it's only like about three. three. <laughs> and all you do is like those little magnets. Size yes. Things yes. Right and but it, it's good for if you do get interested. It's good for. Um, deciding what colors you want that sort of thing because yes. there are some there are some decisions you have to make when you're when you're um, creating with glass they don't all behave the way you think they should mm -hmm. um, but I started this on a whim I had a friend came over and said I have a kiln I'm ready to sell but it was a ceramic kiln I thought okay do I want to do ceramics couldn't think about it. and then one day I saw some glass jewelry and this was 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago. And so it was brand new. It was kind of like, I think people have compared um, fused glass to the macrame of the 21st century. It's like everybody just plunged in, you know? And so I took a leisure learning class. Is, is leisure learning even still around? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I took a leisure learning class and made, made two little lumps of things. And one really fair, I thought, fairly attractive um, wind chime because I didn't know how to cut glass so I just dug through the scraps kind of like the bug class we're going to do today I dug through the scraps until I found the fish I wanted shape that sort of thing and made this really cute wind chime that washed away in Hurricane Ike and so um, I really wish I had that back but I learned just enough to be really dangerous and really expensive and so it didn't take me long to get started with buying a small kiln about the size of the little one I brought here today. But I have upgraded that so it has a little computer on it now and it, it's a whole lot easier to manage. And just kind of went crazy with making small things, little magnets, little jewelry, little little things you didn't have to control a lot because glass does, uh, you do have to, you do have to plan some controlling. Um, you have to control some of the things when you're, when you're cooking glass. Um, until my husband said, what are you going to do with all this stuff? I said, well, for one thing, we're going to go to the sugar, to the Imperial Market, and I'm going to sell some of it, and then I'm going to buy a bigger kiln. And so now I have five. And, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, everything from that little one back there to one that's up high so that I can I can string glass through oh, it. Oh. And it's called Vitrograph. It's a lot of fun. Um, I only can do that in the winter. It's hot. It's in the garage. And... Um, and to a, a large kiln, which is where I'll put, those of you who make the bugs today, which is where I'll put the bugs to, uh, to cook a whole bunch at once. But I've, in the past 10 years, taken lots of classes, done lots of online. You can learn so much online, you know. And, and, um, and so I, I have made quite a, quite a nice hobby out of it. I, after I retired from teaching, I kind of went crazy with it. And so I... Um, I, I was thinking today about what you might want to know if you're interested in, be, in becoming a fuse glass artist in some way. I know you have art tendencies or you wouldn't be here. Um, or I assume we have mostly painters. Painters? Anybody who's not a painter? Both. Oh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What do you do? No, no, I am. Oh, you're a painter. Okay. Do everything. You focus on painting. Yeah. Well, when I first when I first retired, I was doing decorative painting, you know, murals and, and faux finishes and things, and it didn't take me long to realize that that wasn't what I wanted to do. That last ladder stuff was not, not good for me. Um, so anyway, so the, the thing that most people don't understand when, like when I t go to shows and things, what they don't understand is exactly what fused glass is. You know, most people are familiar with stained glass. Um, which is, is cold and it's a matter of cutting and being precise, which is not me. Um, I'm not precise at all. And then there's the other extreme, which would be hot glass, which would be, you know, with the furnace and the glass blowing and all that. And if you read the description, you know I don't wear tank tops and I don't sweat well. And well, my, the people who were here earlier saw me sweating very easily. We're not going out into a hot garage to sweat. So I chose the one in the middle, which is technically called warm glass, even though the, 
the temperatures that you're getting your kiln up to sometimes are as much as 1500 degrees, which sounds hot to me. It's not nearly hot enough for glass blowing. Um, but the whole purpose of, of fusing glass is to soften the glass enough so that it will fuse together during the heating process. And then as it cools, it becomes one solid piece. And so a lot of the things I do will be, will be uh, pieces of glass that are stacked possibly or, or um, put together with something underneath, another piece of glass underneath to keep them all in one, and one, they won't, they won't fuse together like this, in other words. They will only fuse down, basically. They'll pull apart. And so uh, glass wants to be, as they say, wants to be a quarter inch thick. So what I thought today I would show you very quickly, because the, there's, there's nothing quick about fused glass. It takes a lot of patience. That's one of the things you have to learn. And, but there's one thing I can do that will be pretty much complete in about an hour to an hour and a half at the most. And so I'm gonna take my little tiny film back here. And it's not very, this particular, this particular little project is not very technical. I have this little computer here on the side. I'll turn it this way, which I can set so that it tells me how fast I wanna heat it, how high I wanna heat it, uh, how long I wanna heat it, that sort of thing. And then I have all these teeny tiny little squares here that I have glued on a piece of paper that keeps it from sticking to the, it's called uh, refract, refractory paper is what it's technically called. Brand I use is papyrus, but uh, I glued them on here, all these little tiny squares to turn them into little dots. So it'll make them round, it'll puff them up so that they become as close to a quarter of an inch as they can. If you have <clears throat> one layer of glass like this that's an eighth of an inch thick, then it's gonna pretty much double. If you have two layers of glass like here where I have these two, then they should round out to about that size into a sort of a dot because they're not exactly square. I wasn't real meticulous, like I said. That's why I'm not a stained glass artist. Um, <clears throat> and excuse me, I've got that spring stuff. Anyway, so I'm gonna put these in here, actually I'll put it this way, which is really cool, I like this part. Um, it goes in here like this, and then when I decide this, I have, um, usually these come, if you plan to buy a kiln possibly, a little one is not, <clears throat> it's not an outrageous investment. Um, but be sure you get one with a computer on it because if you don't, it's, it's really hard. And, but they do have little custom, um, they already have presets in them, which I don't recommend. So I'm going to do a custom a glass setting. The chill? Mm -hmm. You had a, a gap between the bottom and the inside the, the kiln. Uh -huh. So do you need to put your shelf on and have air between it? I put them on a little stand, uh, okay. yes. You, well, you don't really have to, but it, it keeps from making a heat sink, I think is what it's called. Okay. So you can go let some hit hot air, they're on little posts. I didn't think about that, thank you, Michelle. Um, so that you can get some, the kind of like a convection of it. You want the heat to go all the way around. It's a whole lot better. Now, I have a fiber kiln that you can put flat on the bottom um, because it'll, that's not what I wanted, sorry. It's not reading me right here. Oh, this isn't working. <laughs> That's how this works here. <laughs> I've never had it do that before. That was going for the presets. I'm going to wait just a minute. Okay. It's still not. Custom. Okay. So I'm going up to user. I, I have already put in schedules for certain things I do a lot. User three is the one that I manipulate and don't do the same thing all the time. So I'm gonna choose that one, and then I'm only gonna use one segment, which is very uncommon. If you have little tiny pieces and you want to cook it really fast, which you can with little tiny pieces, you don't have to go through all the other steps I'll talk about in just a minute. But we'll start there, and I'm gonna go up 
as fast as it'll go to 1500 degrees. I'm going to hold it for 20 minutes and then it's going to turn off. And then when it finishes, it'll go beep, 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 and it'll, they'll be round and we'll see them hopefully, depending on how long it takes after all that. Sorry. Um, let's say you want to change these, say these kind of, this is the really pretty dichroic glass that people make jewelry out of, to change this glass into something like this, is that way? Yeah, something like this, or to change these sheets of glass back here to something like this takes a much more complicated schedule. But that's what you start with. You start with little flat sheets of glass. You decide, you design, you decide what you're going to do. And then you create your piece. Like with the piano piece down there, you know, I lay out the colors I want. Or the toucan, which is really the style I do a lot. It's kind of my whimsy, my, I like whimsy, the style I do a lot. Takes, I create the piece, and then I have to decide how I'm going to fire it. The creating part is the fun part obviously, um, and most of you probably, it's, it's like painting, except without being able to manipulate the colors, you kind of have to go with what you got. There are some manipulations you can do, um, but we'll like with Michelle's. I'll, I'll use yours as an app. Michelle made this in one of my classes. Isn't it pretty? She did good. And she made the red one down there in the frame as well. And this required us to think about cool colors, hot colors, stacking colors so that we could get these brown places in here. She didn't put brown in there. That's the chemical reaction between some of the colors. So you have to know things about the colors of your glass and how they behave when they're together. If she had put, <clears throat> if she hadn't put the yellow right there, or that kind of yellow green right there by her other green, it probably would have not turned to that brown color or put the powder on it. There's a different grades of glass powders and things called frit that are little broken up pieces of glass. And, um, and so you do have to know something about how the, the uh, chemistry of the glass, you kind of, you go from being an artist at times into being a scientist, which I never was a scientist. I, I ran away from science as much as I could, but it kind of has forced me to learn a little chemistry, a little physics, and a little biology, depending on how big the wound is, you know, <laughs> when you cut yourself. I, I sliced my hand at the, at the glass um, supplier one day and had to hide it from them because I wasn't wearing my gloves like I was supposed to, just like I'm not wearing my closed toed shoes like I was supposed to today. And so I had to hide it. I took a picture of it and sent it to my doctor on the way home. And he said, I think you need to go to the emergency room. So I ended up with like seven stitches. But um, so you do need, you do need to learn a little bit about biology. The, um, I lost track of what I was doing there then. I kind of got off track. Let me see where I am here. Okay, yeah. Um, so basically in learning, and we're gonna do a lot of stacking today with those if you stay for the class. In learning the, how to change things from this to this. You learn how to cut the glass, how to, um, whoop, there we go, how to cut the glass, how to stack it, how to keep the lines nice and straight. And this part in here, interestingly, is where I put three colors of glass, well, no, two colors, red and yellow, in a, in a um, flower pot with a hole in the bottom, put it in the kiln, a little bit bigger than that one, the taller one anyway, up on some, some lift, some lifts, and let the glass drip through into a big puddle. And it makes these nice pretty swirls. And then just cut the squares out of that and made it as the focal piece. This is the back of them. See, this was the part that was on the kiln shelf. And then built the, the strips around it. And these strips are like quarter inch cuts of sheet glass, like this laid on its side so that <clears throat> you make these really pretty stripes. I was very fortunate with this one in that the front stripes 
and the back stripes are both really straight. That's not usual for me because they have to be cut really, really straight if that's going to happen. You can always count on the back stripes being straight because of the gravity. When you, you know, this started as a big flat circle. I put a dam around it with fiber paper and, and then laid a, a, yeah, laid a flat piece of red and black here and then put stripes like this with these squares in the middle. Laid their stripes on edge. I don't have any edge pieces here. Laid them on edge so that they lined up like little soldiers. And then once it fuses, and that's called a full fuse, that's about close to 1500 degrees, depending on which kiln, that sort of thing. Um, the bottom, the gravity keeps, and the, and the shelf underneath, keeps everything nice and straight. Sometimes the top, if there's a little nip or a little bump or one, you know, like a little flare on one, then it'll kind of swell up and fall over. So the lines on the front sometimes will get, get a little, have a little pant in them somewhere. Fortunately on this one, I didn't have that on either side. If I did, if I had, I would have, I'm sorry, this is dusty. It's been on top of my night, of my, uh, on my, <laughs> um, if I had had those little wiggles and bumps, then I would have turned it over and used the other side, but it would have been a whole different look for this one. And it wouldn't have had my name on it there. It would have my name on it, so. Um, let's see what else. In order, to, in order to design that, once I did my, like I did it on a piece of grid paper, once I did that, figured out what sizes, what shapes, I kind of design on the fly a lot too. Um, and had everything where it was supposed to be. Then I put it all in that dam, put it in the kiln, and had to figure out how I was gonna fire it. Firing it in something like this is gonna, I have to think about how big it is, how much, how many stacks of glass there are. Like these have three or four layers of glass in them. I have to think about how smooth I want it to be after it's fired, so I'll know what the top temperature is. I have to think about what kind of glass it is, which is something else you have to consider um, when you're making anything. Let's see, what else do I have to think about? If there are places where I think that there may be bubbles that will create, because things get trapped between and it's really disappointing when you open your kiln and it, and it kind of has this really beautiful thing and then all of a sudden it goes bloop, you know, it has a big bubble in it. So you have to plan for all those things. So in a case like this, I don't remember what my firing schedule was, but I would say at this point, because it's so large and my cry factor was pretty high and I didn't want to screw it up, um, I would say that it probably went for about, at, at about 250 or 300 degrees which I would set on the little computer, say 300 degrees, up until about 1100 degrees. And that's where all the glass is starting to get soft. And you want to even out, being as big as it is, you want to even out those, those, that heat all across the piece. So I would stop at 1100 degrees and let it sit there at that temperature for say 10 or 15 minutes, sometimes as long as 30 and then decide if it's, in this case, it wasn't built in such a way that it was gonna have bubbles in it. Um, like the piano would have had bubbles had I not, because they're all just pieces like this. This one down here were pieces like this, so the air could escape, the heat could escape. So I didn't have to worry about the bubbles. So I probably then turned it as fast as I could up until, in my kiln, about 1475 so that it got that smooth finish, nice and glossy, flat, nothing bumpy, no, you can't feel a difference in the, in the stripes of the lines, and, um, and let it sit at 1475 for about probably 10 or 15 minutes. Then you have to drop the temperature as fast as you can because there's a range in the, in the, the there's a range of temperature in some of the glasses that will cause something called devitrification. If you hold the glass at certain points, then the molecules, this is where I learned my science, this is, <laughs> the molecules become crystallized and they create more of a, 
that looks like it's been sandblasted, but not nearly as attractive as something that's been sandblasted and smoothed out. So it will, you have to drop that temperature down to whatever type of glass the glass manufacturer tells you what temperature it's called annealing. And I always thought of it like um, you, as a teacher, one thing I would do every day would be like after lunch was always recess after lunch. So they have this big break in the cafeteria. Then they have all that running around outside and out on the playground after lunch. Then you go in and you can't just go right to math or right to reading or whatever you were gonna do. You have to kind of give them a chance to settle down. So that's when you would sit and read them a book. And this is like, that's called annealing. And annealing for these little molecules is like reading them a book. They've bounced around, they've slowly gotten busier and busier, and then they finally have all joined together. And if you don't give them a chance to calm down, they're not gonna stay together. And so you end up, you take it out, it looks real great until about, you know, five days later maybe, and all of a sudden you hear this thing go ping, and those pieces just come apart because they have not had a chance. So they have to, depending on how thick it is, how big it is, how many layers it is, all kinds of things go into how long do you hold it at that temperature in the glass I use, which is uh, system 96, it's called, and I'll explain that in just a second. You have to hold it at 950 degrees, and then you determine how long. That one, I probably, because I didn't want it to come apart, and I wanted it to last a long time, and I was really, I had worked really hard on it, I probably held it for three hours there. And then you can slowly start cooling it down. But you gotta get all your little children back in line before you can let that go. And that's the hardest, that was the hardest thing for me. And that's what makes the, that's what makes the, um, the firing schedules so long. Cause that was probably in the kiln for 23 hours, 23 or 24 hours. And so when someone says, you know, I need something tomorrow, can you make this? I'm going like, mm, no, sorry. You know, maybe, maybe by next week, by the time I get it put together and by, you know, by the time I get the glass that I need and that sort of thing. And so it's, it's, it's not, you have to learn some patience and you have to learn some science. It's not a cupcake. And you, and, uh, <laughs> it's not a cupcake. It's not a cupcake. That's right. But, you know, there's chemistry in cupcakes. So I, I never knew I was going to be a scientist, but that's what I did. Anyway, once I got the, once I got the big circle all flat and pretty, then I put it into a mold like this. And then you go through the whole process again, except this time, when you, once you put it on the mold, it doesn't take nearly that much, that high a heat to get all of that to just fall down into that shape. And so you can, you can, go, you can go slowly, because you don't want it to crack going up. Lots of thermal shock issues. You don't want it to, go, to crack going up so you determine, probably on this one, maybe about 200 degrees an hour. Then you take it up to say 1200 and you hold it there until, and you keep checking. And then you, eventually you learn how long, but you keep checking and then eventually it becomes that nice shape. It's nice and flat on the bottom. It's, it's curved nicely on the sides. It can loop to one side or whatever. Everything's nice and level. Then you can go through those final steps again. Drop it fast, hold it at that, at that annealing temperature, let those children all get back in line again because they've all gone crazy again. And then let it cool gently and then that's what you have. Um, so that's one of the things that I do. Another thing I do is my, like I said down there, kind of the toucan, like my little style is, <clears throat> I would fuse the, um, let's see if I can get over here. I would fuse the base of this, this blue circle first, go through the steps from this. This not as critical, it's only two layers. The only thing you have to worry about when you're doing just this one layer, this, these two, can you see the clear circle back there in the back? Yeah, like that, that big clear circle. The only thing you have to worry about here is that's when you worry about the bubbles because the air gets between there. You have to give it a chance for that air, that heat to, to um, dissipate or not dissipate, but it's kind of even out. Ooh, glad that wasn't me. Yeah, that, that glass to dissipate, I mean, to, to even out. And then, <clears throat> and then, then you're, gonna, you're going to want 
the, the two layers. This is like a clear layer of glass and a blue, a clear blue layer, or a transparent blue layer. So, so you want those things to, to fuse together or melt together so that you don't have like a bump, like mumps, I call them mumps. They're kind of like just swelling, swollen places mm -hmm. where the glass gets trapped in there. So that's when you would, in your fusing schedule, you would put, put a step in there where it, it went up very, very slowly. So that the whole time that top layer is falling more like this, rather than the edges falling first and trapping that air inside and then falling down. So <clears throat> in other words, you couldn't do this in one step. You would have to do this first, then you put your design on top, and then you fire this again. Almost everything takes more than one step. With Michelle's piece down here, the piece in the middle is what we did in class. Then <clears throat> she went home. You did it at home, right? I did at Joyce's. Yeah. At Joyce's, okay. Mm -hmm. Then she's the one. She put it on top of the green, and then then put put her last cute little checkerboard around the side, and did all did the design work afterwards. So that was a second step, and then to get the shape, that was a third step. I think so, it had four. four. Do you have another one? What was the other one? Well, we 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 did we we. We melted the, the, the middle piece, mm -hmm. and then I we did uh, another did the outer stuff, mm -hmm. um, and then we melted it or fused it together, and so and then the fourth yeah the fourth step was the shape yeah yeah, the yeah. so it it takes yeah it takes a while and that's a bowl similar to this one here, but it's just bigger. It's a sushi mold. I'll show you those in just a second. Oh, that um, centerpiece is like that red one. That's what it was. I mean, the, in the in the frame, <coughs> in the in the black frame. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, that's yes. what it. it that's yeah, piece. that's what this is. This is what it looked. Well, except for the colors. This is what it looked like bef before she turned it into this really pretty plate. So I like the way she framed it here. It looks very nice. And you can see bubbles in that one. You can see bubbles in that one. Can I pass it around? Yeah. And these, this was so many layers of glass and so many different pieces and so many places for glass to get trapped. Just like, I mean, for air, excuse me, just like in the jewelry pieces, you just, you have to really, I mean, you're just creating bubbles. So you really have to, you wanna pass that around? I'll show you where they are. See the, that kind of S? There's some here, down here around the S. So it, and there was, I know in my schedule for that, there was a long bubble squeeze. It's called a bubble squeeze. There was a long section in there for that air to all get out from under because that the glass was just, you know, piles and piles. Um, and and so they still, there's still <coughs> bubbles. I and mean, that's just the nature of, it's artistry. Artistry, that's the nature of it. Um, Cheryl? Me? Mm -hmm. You said that. Glass only melts down. So I was thinking the same you thing. Get yeah. That yeah. Plate, the one this one? Yeah, so that's not melted down. How did you get those lines? The lines. Okay. Let me get my glass cut off. Okay, so I didn't get my brain. So I'm going to cut strips like this. Say that, say this is a it's about a quarter of an inch. There's two of them. Maybe I can get those off. Maybe. Um. Uh, what? You need these? Okay. Oh. Mm. Okay, so so let's say these are two different colors. When I'm in in my dam that's just kind of rounded, then I put my pieces like this. I should have cut two different colors. So I have say red, black, red, black, red, black, red, black. And these are all held together this way because of that dam. When it when it fuses or melts, 
it's going to melt this way, which will also, because, because they're crammed together, they're going to stick together. But now if I had tried just out in the open to put those two pieces back together like that, just lay them in the kiln like that, they would not. But this way, there's enough surface and they're squeezed together like a, with a rubber band almost, except it's, does that make sense? Am I making sense at all? No? <laughs> yeah, okay. So. Um, let me see. I don't think I have anything that I could use. Okay, let's just, I'm going to take this out a second if I can. Okay, so say say I wanted to put, I'll show you this in a minute. Say I wanted to make those stripes down in here. I would I would cut my little pieces so that they're in this way like that, all the way down to the bottom, and they would stop here, and they would be in all the way to that edge, and there would be something to contain them. I need a piece of paper is what I need. To contain them. And when they're contained and they're squeezed together, they're not going to reject each other. It's not like a magnet, you know, that you put the two poles together. Um, just the fact of having them squished together is going to keep them together. Is that what your question is? Yeah. How these don't, how, why these didn't separate. Yeah. yeah. Because I've mashed them together so that they had no place to go mm. but stick. There you go. Did that help? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thanks for the question because that, I, I should have thought about that. I didn't think about it at all. But, um, and the same with this. This piece is called combing. And this center piece right here was made with lots and lots of strips of glass like this. Mm -hmm. So that they're stacked, like I had red, 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 clear, red, clear, red, clear, and then that kind of a hyacinth or hydrangea color, you know, and in a pattern. I made a pattern. But they were all, they were all just straight lines. Color, clear, color, clear color clear in a square that squeezed them together so that they had no place to go but together and then when they were nice and hot um, we opened the kiln I took a big thing called a rake it looks kind of like this but it's a lot bigger and it's just got a, a stick on the end I mean like a piece of metal on the end with a long handle and you reach in there and you start you start pushing it and pulling it like this so that you create the pattern in it. And um, you, can see the, you can see the colors back here too. See how they're kind of lined up? They look completely different on the back. How they're lined up like kind of, what did I say that was? Hydrangea, then blue, then turquoise, then tea, uh, like peacock, then green, then yellow, then orange. And the same thing here over and over and over and over again until I got down here and I kind of ran out of something, I think. So I put the red in and it came out, I like it better with the red in it down there. You know, it's just, it's so that it created, it's not as static, you know, when you do that. But, but even right here where the clear is a lot wider, it's still just one strip like this of clear glass all the way across. Um, and then when I put it, this, so then I had this square of glass that I didn't know what to do with. And so I put it in between layers of white glass with stripes and tried to line the stripes up as best I could with the way the flare out over here is. And it's really interesting in that I put up, this is a three layer piece. Um, so I had to dam it or because it wants to be a quarter of an inch, it would have spread out because then it would have been, I would have started with three-eighths of an inch of glass. So I wanted to keep it three-eighths of an inch because that's how thick this was. So I put I put um, fiber that doesn't stick to glass and then little pieces, that, they're like little ceramic pieces that, that go, that you just like push up against it and put something to hold them there like, a, like a, another post, like those little things there that just keep it from moving. And, um, in this nice square so that when I got finished, it would be a flat one of these because this is this is the size I wanted. Or it would have spread out, it would have 
messed up my straight lines. It would have probably distorted this as well because it's it, it's not going to want to it, it it wasn't it wasn't going to want to stay this thick unless I made it stay this thick. I had to manipulate it, um, and then I put it on a mold that was shaped like that and then sunk it down in there. And what's really interesting is because I put the clear strips in between, if you look at it, I'll pass this around too if y'all be real careful because I'm not ever giving up this, uh, this piece. <laughs> um, you can see, if you look at it from the side, like I don't know if you can see it from there, but where I put the, 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 the purplish kind of strips there, you can see those colors coming through here, which just creates another another interest. Do you um, mm -hmm. buy those molds or do you make them yourself? I can, I can make them, but it's it's way hard. I mean, not hard, but it's just one more thing. It's one more messy thing to do. And it's one more um, thing to buy stuff for. I buy enough. Um, these are, they're made out of, they're just ceramic molds. You can use dishes, actually. Um, like if, you know, if they're dishes, not if they're glass, but if they're, uh, if they're ceramic dishes, you can do, use that and, and make your own. You just have to make sure you have something on there so that the glass doesn't stick to it. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there's, there's something called ZIP or ZYP, and it's a, I think it was originally a lubricant for, for motors, and it, you can spray it on, and it, nothing will stick to it. It won't, well, things will stick to it, but glass isn't gonna stick to it, and not at the temperatures we use. And um, I'm thinking there's some, oh, and there's another thing that the, uh, on, on, on these kinds of things, you can use something called kiln wash, like you can put on your shelf as well in a kiln, um, that, that you paint on, and it, it's, a, it's a separator. It just protects, it, in other words, it, it can stand the heat of the glass without without uh, changing its its con uh, yeah changing what it is also um, and so and that's what because that's a lot cheaper so that's why you'll see the drips on here where I've painted it on it's pink when you paint it on and then once you fire it it turns to that powder stuff but you can use it several times on that on this. Um, of this particular piece, if you can see the tiny bubbles in here, this was because, bubbles, this was because I used two pieces of glass that, that had, that had, it was like called corded glass, so that it was like corduroy, kind of. So you put one piece this way and one piece this way, and then I trapped all those teeny tiny bubbles on purpose. And then on top, I used a stencil and powdered glass to put the, the Nautilus on it. Then it went on, I fused it full, 1475, and then put it on that mold and made it. Now, I have a question after, see if I've explained things well here on some things. Since I spent a lot of time on bubbles, and I have a lot of bubbles in that, and they're like a grid when you see it. When I develop a, a, um, a firing schedule, when I develop a firing schedule for that, would I put something in there, do you think, as a bubble squeeze to squeeze the bubbles out? No. So see, that's something else I had to consider. I created those bubbles on purpose. Now, the bubbles that you typically get that you don't want, they aren't nearly that pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure that out though, because those are cool bubbles. Those are cool bubbles, yeah. And you can do the same thing without that kind of glass if you use little strings of glass. They're called stringers, and they are. Let's see if I have them here. I can get to them. Yeah, here's some. I have so much stuff. They're little pieces of glass like this. I mean, like spaghetti, spaghetti. spaghetti. Uh -huh. like spaghetti, and and if you lay them out on a grid, you can get bubbles there too. Just you're because you're planning, 
you're planting it so that the air gets trapped. The air can't go anywhere except sometimes you'll get the bubbles right at each, each corner of these little strings. If you, so if you have a, a grid like this, you'll get bubbles at each of those little four corners. Sometimes you'll, depending on where they lay, you'll get a big bubble between in the little squares that you create. It's really fun. I mean, it's fun to experiment with, and um, but it's it's not fun when you don't pay attention to what you're doing and you just rely on somebody else's firing schedule and you make this really pretty. Don't you like those colors? It's gorgeous. I love these colors, and I put it on a piece of iridescent on the back, so it's real. But but if you'll notice, it has this funny little lip here that wasn't supposed to be there. And it, because when I looked in the kiln, it looked real good. And I thought, well, that looks real good, but I think I'll leave it a little bit longer just to make sure that the bottom's flat. Because occasionally you can't tell if the bottom's flat or not. Mm -hmm. And so I left it just a little bit longer. And then all of a sudden the sides just kind of, that one side just kind of went bleh and fell down in there. And so now it has, now it's mine. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. It stays on. There's a little lip on the other side too. All four of them have them, but this one right here is a big one. I mean, you can stick your fingers under there. That just makes it more special. It's a it's, grip. It's a what? Grip. It's a grip. Yeah. Thank you. It's a so foot. It's Let's it's call it a foot. foot. Yes. <laughs> we, found that, we found that the Fort Ben Arts Center, a lot of times, things like that will sell more than things that look like they're machine. Really? Yeah, it's like they, they want the uniqueness of the Well, this is unique. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of unique. I call it my boxy <laughs> dreadfuls. Yeah, but there's a lot of people that that's what they want. They want something that looks like it's handmade and not something made by a machine. Well, that's good. And then I'll, I'll put this one in the God Gallery. <laughs> I have things. By the way, I do have some things in a couple of galleries in Galveston. I do a lot of, of uh, fish, seaside, beach, tropical. I do a lot of that. And so there are some galleries. There's one on uh, the Strand called G. Lee Gallery. And first and to, probably mention, put um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Strand or not, but there's a shop called, I think it's the Admiralty. There's a building and it's, it's a souvenir shop. It's really high class souvenirs. I mean, they're, they're nice looking. And you kind of have to go inside. She always puts a sign outside. And she's got some beautiful paintings and some nice um, nice photography. I think she still has some photography. But you should G. Period Lee. And it's on the Strand, and I don't have that address. I'm sorry, I should have. Anyway, but it's a nice, it's, it's a very small art gallery. Um, it has jewelry, it has uh, like hand-woven scarves that are beautiful. It has some pottery. She's got a nice variety of things, but she has a lot. She, she, she focused when she started. Her husband was a painter and he started it. And so, so she has stayed kind of focused on the paintings, but she does have some other things in there that you might be interested in going. It'd be a nice field trip for your group. To go. What's the other gallery here? The other gallery is called From the Heart, and it's more of a collective. You know, um, it's it's on post office, and it's a lot bigger. It's it's the kind where everybody has their space. Well, and so is so is the G League. Everybody has their space, but hers is a little more intimate. But the um, but the one on From the Heart, it has photography, painting. Um, woodworking, sculpture, um, floral arranging. I'm trying to think what else it has. It, it's got it all. It's got lots of stuff and it's a real fun one. I would go there too. It's called From the Heart and it's, it's right in the middle block, I think, of, of the art area of post office across from the Mod Coffee Shop. So that will give you some some clues. And also, I have my cards and it has my Facebook page thing. I don't, you know, I make a better glass artist than I do a web page designer. And so, so I just post things on Facebook. I haven't started selling online. It's, you know, I tried for a while and it was like, how do I get anybody there? How do I get traffic? You know, it was just, it was too much. So, um, 
so you can go to my page and you'll see I will post things from from the heart and from uh, G Lee Gallery also occasionally and it'll give you the address and it'll show you some of the other things that they do there occasionally uh, and there's once once every six weeks Galveston has art walk have y'all ever been to that okay <clears throat> art walk is mostly on post office but but it also spills over onto the Strand and some of the other areas and it, it's basically a big open house for all the galleries. You get wine, cookies, whatever, and you just go from place to place. And it, it draws, it, you know, obviously not in the past year, but most of the time it draws a really good crowd. And if, if the weather's nice, it's a very nice evening. And you can see a lot of really cool things. So, do I have any questions before I go on? Oh, oh yes, ma'am. So you, you work towards getting the bubbles out? I do most, most of the time. Of the time. Uh -huh. I notice in that, that piece, if you look real closely, you have like tiny, tiny bubbles. There are, yes, there are, there are some things called champagne bubbles, mm -hmm. and there is no way to avoid them, okay. you know. But the ones that I try to avoid the most are the ones that make, that they don't necessarily look like a bubble bubble. Yeah. They, they make a bump, like, oh, um, okay. yeah, like, almost like the opposite of a divot, you know, it's, it's, Indented more. In, in it's it's no. It's like a, a like a divot. I think of as an indention. This is more like like a hump. Uh, kind of like a pancake before the bubble pops. Yes. 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 <laughs> and then there have been times I've opened it up, and I mean there's been a bubble, like whoosh, a bubble. Wow. Like you turn this upside down. I'm thinking, okay, where did that come from? And a lot of times it'll be not just from trapping the air in there. It'll be from some some space in your on your shelf that you put it in in the kiln they'll it'll be on a on a space in there that maybe has a little bit of a of a dip in it if you don't have a perfectly straight one mm -hmm. and you don't always see it you know uh it'll have a little a little dip in it and then that air gets in there and the glass is sitting out here and it has no place to go but up is there any way to get that out once it's you can use the other side of the kiln sh kiln shelf but there's no way to get it out of the glass no well you can drill it out and you can try to fill it with something um but it never is the same it's just not right you know however i did have one one time i made i had this really cute crab on the on the corner of something and it was going to be a it was going to be a bowl i think or a plate probably something like that i can't remember now it was a long time ago and it got one of those because the crab i think because it, the crab was this style so it, it was creating more weight on one side. So this is before I learned you do the bottom first, you do the base first. And so I was doing all one, one time. And so I had all that extra glass. So I had these two pieces here. I had all those, that extra glass right here that was heavy. And so that side squeezed down and it pushed all the air over here. Well, by that time, the edges of over here had had fused together so that it made this gigantic bubble over here. And so I was just a baby, baby fuser then. That was probably 10 years ago. And um, so what I did was I drilled the bubble out. I kind of smoothed it with a grinder, like a Dremel and diamond, diamond grinding bits. And I smoothed the, the hole so it was nice and round. I put it back in the kiln and did something that's called a fire polish which we didn't talk about, but but it's it's basically, you fuse it just hot enough to get the edges of the glass so that they're not like this, you know, like this. They're, they're smoother, they're not sharp, they're just a little smoother, and it, so I had that hole, and one of those little tea light candle holders fit right down in there was perfect. <laughs> it just, it turned out perfect. That bubble was a happy accident. But it forced me to have to work on it more and not do something new. Mm -hmm. Do you ever try to make really big bubbles on purpose? I've never. Well, no. Now, there's some stuff you can use. I haven't tried to do it on purpose. But there's some stuff you can use that will create bubbles in the glass on purpose. And I've done that. You can use, like, calcium. I know. Uh, oh, carbonate. Car calcium carbonate. No, not calcium carbonate. Uh, I can't remember. Copper, copper, copper oxides and copper carbonate. You can sprinkle between the glass. It will turn 
the bubbles turquoise, really pretty. Turn the mm -hmm. bubbles turquoise and you'll get a lot of small bubbles, kind of like these, but may, maybe even smaller. You'll get a lot, I mean like tons of small bubbles. And um, so I made those on purpose. You can also do it with baking soda, I understand, but I haven't been real successful with that. I have made some big bubbles with that. You can put baking soda between the glass and the baking soda reacts in some way that creates the heat, heat spots and you can, you can come up with some pretty big bubbles there. But usually when that happens, the glass on top is so thin, you really can't rely on it. You know, you can almost poke your finger through it if you were brave enough. Yeah, so. Um, so you, you have to, I have seen though, like on Facebook and things where I'm in a lot of Facebook groups that are for fuse, for fuse glass people. And um, some people have created some nice, sturdy, big bubbles not on purpose, but it turned out really great. I mean, it, it looked good, you know, and so they left them. Um, it's art after all. But, um, something else that you can do with glass, and I have this one here that we've talked about. Now this one is not painted with the, the kiln wash like these are. This is the spray stuff, because this is glass casting, and casting requires a really high heat for quite a while. And so this is made with, uh, now I put it back in there, it's kind of all dusty and yucky because the stuff turns to dust. Um, I'm gonna start at this end this time. This is made with chunks of glass. So what I did with this one, you wanna pass this one around? What I did with that one was I, um, I took a jar mixed the, the little pieces of glass are called frit. And I took a jar and mixed some of the, the transparent green frit with some of the clear green frit that's pieces about that big, about the big, as big as the end of my finger, probably. And mixed that up real well and then poured it into the mold and then piled just whatever scraps of clear glass I had left on the top of the mold so that once it fused all together, this has all the detail in it. It has all the, you know, the bumps on the starfish. It has all the detail and stuff in there. So I put the colored fret down in here, and then I started just piling big pieces of clear glass in there, whatever, because I just, I keep jars and jars of it from things that I cut. Um, and pile it on top so it doesn't come over the top, but it fills in pretty well. And then you put this in the kiln and fuse it to probably about 1500 for, I would say 30 or 40 minutes, which is a, a long time. Um, so you don't want to, so the, the ZYP or the zip is a whole lot more reliable at those high temperatures than just kiln wash. Now you can do it, but you run the risk of losing losing your glass and your mold, because once it gets stuck in there, you're stuck. Why don't you always just use this VYP? It's a lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. So I usually do, but I wouldn't like on these things because this one application of the kiln wash is gonna take, um, I bet I could probably use that because I'm not heating it that high. I could probably use that for almost forever without having to put more on there. Mm -hmm. But this, I have to put it on every two or three times. Yeah, I love the ZYP. Mm -hmm. Is this the, the bump that you were talking about? Something like, or is that in the impression? No, that's where the glass was just a little bit taller here. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So it doesn't level out. Yeah, it, and well, it typically levels out, but it does, you know, it had no place to go. So it was just a little bit, I just didn't clear it off good enough, but yeah. So you dropped the other glasses in the, the clear first and no I put the color first the color because first. see you work upside down oh, okay. mm -hmm. so you put the color first down in here okay. and then you put the clear on top clear. Mm -hmm. and those are really pretty when you use like iridescent glass mm -hmm. you know in there because it gives it a, a sheen or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let's see that's what this is Water 
It does. Uh huh. Especially the back of it. Yeah. And they do it. Now that is done with um, with powdered glass. The whole thing with powdered glass that you take the iridescent glass, just a circle of it, and then you mix your powdered glass into a like a slurpy kind of. It looks powder and water into something that feels and looks like a slurpy, a, a really wet slurpy, kind of partially melted. And so then you just start putting your colors around in circles, concentric circles on the glass and just, you know, manipulate them a little bit because they're gonna run like a tie-dye almost. And put some chunks of glass on top, like the black little pieces of glass or whatever. And um, once it dries, supposedly, and I'm not gonna do it this way again, but once it dries, you're supposed to just put it, you put it on the mold with just that dry powder on it. And then you, you slump it very slowly. And at the same time that it's slumping, and that's what, when you put it in the glass and let it fall, that's called slumping. At the same time that it's slumping, the powders are also fusing into the glass base. And so it's all one step, which is really rare. We don't do one step that often. Um, I think next time I do one though, I will probably do it in two steps. Fuse it all in there first, then put it in the mold and let it let it fall. And I think I'll be I'll feel better about my reliability. Any other questions? I haven't talked an hour yet. So that's lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if there's anything else I need to let's see. So on the two can, um, yeah. you said you did the base first, uh -huh. and then you went in and you, when you when you're putting your pieces together, you're like you use like a super glue type thing to keep the pieces together, right? Well, when I'm working, if I can work in the kiln, I will. Like in the winter, I can work in the kiln because they're in the garage, and it's not so hot, um, and I can build it out there. I have my pieces. Say I put my I cut the pieces I want. And I can build it inside, see where I want everything, take them out there, put it together in the kiln and fuse it. Typically, because it's so hot here almost all the time, um, yes, I use super glue. Now, there is a, there are some people who are very concerned about super glue. I'm not. I was in a class, one of the first classes I took was with a man called Barry Kaiser, who was an, a retired engineer who had become a glass artist. And he went through all the um, the safety issues with with burning super glue. Super glue has a cyan something in it that people equate with cyanide, and it it may even be close to cyanide. But the way it burns off, it doesn't act like cyanide on your body. Thank goodness, I wouldn't be here today if it did, because um, I use it a lot. But but you, I, you also stick your fingers together. You know, you, you stick things to your eye. I've gotten my lips stuck together before. Um, and I have put things that just the super glue just, it wasn't holding it. And so of course it didn't hold it until I put it in the wrong place. You know, so you just have to kind of learn to work with it. You have to be careful. And if you're staying for the bug class today, we're using super glue. So I hope I've heard the cheaper the better. The cheaper the better. I get it at the mm -hmm. Dollar Tree. Dollar stuff. Mm -hmm. At the Dollar Tree, but it's I mean it's it's super glue. It's not, but not the gel. The gel leaves a black mucky mark on it. Um, now you can also use clear Elmers, and that's what I used on those because I knew we were going to be in here. I didn't want anybody who was concerned about it, you know. Um, to keep them on the paper like that's that's in my studio in the house we just the the week before the the shutdown last year they tore my kitchen out which didn't work out well and um we were we were refinished we we live in we've lived in quail valley since 1976 i think no no 1979 we lived in quail valley since 1979 and the house wasn't new when we bought it so it was time to redo the kitchen. You know, it's being redone a little bit, but we really you know, we took out walls, did the whole thing, um, and added a studio on the back, which I'm, I'm just in heaven 
you know, it, it's, I haven't gotten it organized right yet. But um, what were we talking about? <laughs> super glue. Super glue. Super glue. That, so that kiln stays in my studio because I can make the dots that I use all the time. You know, I can I can do all those kinds of things. I just so, and it and I super glue stuff that I put in there. And I've been in the studio with it. It doesn't bother me. It, and, you know, I don't I don't notice it. Now I'm surprised we didn't notice. Did anybody notice the smell of that paper? No? That's really weird because usually you it has a kind of a, a sugary sweet like burning sugar smell sometimes when the binders in the paper. Basically, the paper is made out of the stuff I paint on here, except they put a binder in it to keep it as a sheet of paper. Um, and you'll notice a really bad smell sometimes, like sick, sicky sweet smell. Not bad, but sicky sweet. It doesn't bother me. I'm so used to it. Um, and people will get scared with that. But, but um, I guess you could be you could be a little sensitive to the to the uh, super glue as it burns off. You know, if your if your eyes are real sensitive to things, I'm fortunate they aren't that they that mine aren't. Uh, so I use super glue a lot, but you, like I said, you can also use Elmer's clear glue, not the white stuff. Um, a lot of people do use the white; they water it down, but I use the clear occasionally, and I have had some reactions with that where that like I was making some larger dots that like those those that I had crisscrossed and I stuck them together with a tiny dot of that clear blue and I got a brown line around the edge and I don't know why I haven't figured that out yet so so I just used I used it on these purple ones today and we'll see how that comes out um but uh like with these in order for me to get these back to my house I don't want your work to get to fall apart before I get it there because I would never get it back where it was supposed to be. Uh, so, so I will. So we'll use super glue today, and we'll just be careful with it. And I'll go put them in the kiln when I get home, and and they'll be ready for your lunch, lunch, lunch. lunch. Um, any more questions? Because really, I can't think of anything else I want to. I want to. I don't have any secrets. So ask me. I don't mind telling you if I do, if I forgot something. The um, yeah. copper you use. Uh huh. Does it? Um, if we make these bugs and mm -hmm. we put them outside, will it or will it deteriorate over time? It doesn't deteriorate. It will um, patina. Patina. You know, it just kind of turns a little brown. And these, uh, and they'll be cleaned up by the time you get them. But when I when I uh, fire these, the copper does something called spall. Mm -hmm. And it gets a black, crusty, um, ashy stuff on it, um, and so I just scrub that off, you know. And I and and I have some of these in my yard that I think I don't even notice that the colors change that much, mm -hmm. you know. I'm making some now, and I have only made one or two, um, but they're these giant flowers on larger copper tubing that kind of swirl up. You know the the stems, yeah. and I'm making some. I'm making some of those now for home, and then I'll probably start marketing those eventually. But um, but it's it's got a lot of copper in it also. And these this is just um, refrigerator tubing, like uh, for water, like ice makers. For ice makers, comes in a coil, straighten it out. I hammer part of it on the back, and this is glued on with a GE silicone two. Yeah, GE silicone two, it's called, because it it expands and contracts. Would not recommend super. I'm not super. Well, not super glue because it's not going to hold it. But uh, or epoxy. Epoxy doesn't expand and contract but the silicone does. So it, it's pretty reliable. Every once in a while one, one will come apart, but very rarely, very rarely. What about E6000? E6000, I, I use E6000 on my jewelry, and I know a lot of people don't like that either, but 
You know, it's, you just kind of decide what you can work with and what you can't. Um, I use E6000 on my jewelry. I haven't used E6000 on this. I don't know if it does the expanding and contraction, contracting or not. It's very rubbery when it dries, so I would think it would. It probably would then. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it, actually. It's smelly. Mm -hmm. It's very smelly. It's smelly. But, you know, you get high enough, you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see if there's anything else. This... I'll, I'll, I'll give away a little secret about this. This odd shape, I like it better this way than what it was intended for. These are, by the way, these little stands down here, and you could probably use them for, you know, if you had something not not as as thick as those, obviously, but if you had a, like a little a little canvas of some kind, you wanted to not frame, and you just wanted to make a stand. These are called glass shelf supports. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been able to find them at, um, let's see, here's the back. So they hang on the shelf like, like that. And then, oh, on the wall, excuse me, and then your shelf fits in between. Um, I haven't been able to find them at any local stores, but you can get them at Amazon and they're not expensive at all. Oh, and a new, th anyway, what this, this mold is supposed to be like this. Can you think about what it might be supposed to be for? What it was designed for when I got it? The shape. A wine bottle, bottle holder. Which is okay. Believe me, I like wine. But I don't, you know, I, and I've, I've tried to do the thing with the wine on them. And, it just, and then I thought, okay, well, what about um, uh, guest towels? In the, you know, like hand towels rolled up. And that works okay in the bathroom, but I just think I like it as an art piece better. So, you know, there's a fine line, especially with, with glass art. Stained glass you think of as, as decorative people, but, but people think sometimes of like these kinds of things as well, it has to be functional. And it doesn't have to be functional. You know, I, when I would do shows and somebody would come by and say, but what do you use it for? <laughs> I don't know. It's like, look at it. Keep <laughs> walking. I make these coral bowls. I, you've probably seen them. They're everywhere. Anyway, I make these bowls that look like they've got holes all, everywhere in them. They look like coral. Well, what do you use it for? And my answer is usually, well, you don't use it for soup. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but if you need to use it for something, you can put rolls in it, possibly. But you're not going to put a little bit, no peas and no soup. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, this is terrible. It's almost insulting, you know. It's like, I'm not Walmart. And um, it's art. It's art. And so, and most people recognize it as art. It's just that because it's glass, they think it has to be. It has to be useful because that's what they're used to, and and they're used to paintings being you know, art, decorative. Look at it; it's pretty. But this this is pretty. But what do you use it for? Or um, what is it? Somebody else said one time. I don't remember now. Anyway, is it, is it but I did safe? have that, huh? Is it food safe? I mean, if you were to use it, it is food safe. I would say there are some colors that are not. The red is not. Mm. Like, I would not put food in this. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would... Honestly, honestly, if, if, if I were to have... If it were just for me, I probably wouldn't worry about it. But for other people, I would. You know, yeah. it would be a really... This shape itself is a, would be a really pretty, like, canopy. Canopy? Canopy? Hoarders. <laughs> yeah. Tray. Um... But but I but the red I'm pretty sure is not reliably food, food safe. Everything else is. I usually I usually tell tell um, like I tell them in the gallery unless I tell you it's not food safe it's food safe. Now if I had put a clear on top of this it would have been fine. You know a piece of because the clear glass is food safe. I would say that Michelle's piece, piece is food safe. I know my my um, pieces over there are food safe. Yeah, um, but the the red is iffy because it has cadmium in it, I think. 
-hmm. And the yellow has cadmium also. Yeah, those two. And I've tried to find a list of which ones I can rely on and which ones I can't. And I can't find, nobody can direct me to one, you know? So I guess I probably, I haven't thought about contacting the, the manufacturer. That was one thing I didn't talk about. If you decide you want to start fusing, say little kiln, big kiln, whatever. If you decide you want to do that, you have to decide before you, from, from experience, I will say, before you ever start, decide whether you want to use, it's called, well, okay, this is what almost, sorry, back up. This is what almost pushed me away from fusing glass. The first time in that leisure learning class that the lady said coefficient of expansion, I just kind of went, whoosh. you know, that meant nothing to me. But basically, it is that some glasses expand and contract at different at other as other glasses. And when you start to fuse glass, you want them to be compatible. You want them to fuse uh, to expand and contract at the same same rate, which is the simple answer. So don't give me big words like coefficient of expansion. Tell me they need to do this. So just buy them from one company, you know, and there are two major companies and then a few minor ones, but one major company is called Bullseye and it's up in um, Washington, I think. Washington or Oregon, I get those two states confused. And its coefficient of expansion is 90. So they test their glass, they make sure that their glass has has all the qualities that they need that will that they can work together they're compatible my the glass i use is called system 96 and it was originally up there also but there was a big thing recent well in the last probably five years um, of environmentalists who got real upset about the emissions that those companies were sending out and it basically put Spectrum System 96 out of business because they couldn't, they couldn't retrofit their, their manufacturing to, to meet all the standards. Bullseye has managed to do it, so they're still up there. The, the System 96 was bought out by um, Oceanside, is, an, is the company now, and they have managed to figure out how to do it with the proper materials, but they are now in South, Southern California and Mexico, down there. Uh, I like the colors, myself, I like the colors of bullseye better. I like the cutability and the um, versatility, kind of the ease, the ease of Spectrum 96. It's, it's a lot smoother. It, um, it comes in colors that I like. There are a few colors that the other one makes that I have bought a few pieces of, you know, but I keep them way separate because if you put them, if you mistake, you know, if you mistake this piece as one that's compatible with these pieces and I put that one little piece of red in there, the whole piece is ruined. It will, it will explode almost. Not explode, like boom. But it will, it will push away. It will have a big crack through it. You won't even make it out of the kiln. So it has to be compatible. Um, now there are things like enamels. I know you guys paint. Most of you said you were painters. So there are some enamels you can use on glass that will, you can use on any glass. You can use on float glass, glass like window glass. Um, and there's a whole, there's a whole series of, a, a whole group of artists who do nothing but window glass. They paint on it, they fuse with it, they, um, they do, they do the, the combings with it. They, they, they are masters at it. There's one lady, her name is Jody McCraney Rusho, and she does only recycled glass. She has, she takes bottles and she teaches. In fact, she, she has some, some workshops on, or some videos and some instructions on her website. It's called Glass with a Past. Um, she teaches how to how to cut the bottle, how to flatten it, how to test and make sure. Because some bottles are compatible, but some of them aren't. I mean, they if you're going to make a bottle, if you got if you're going to make 25 pickle jars at a factory, you don't care if those pickle jars are the same glass or not. 
as long as that one pickle jar is made out of the same batch. But, um, but she, she teaches how to test to make sure that they are compatible. There are ways to test it. Um, she, she teaches how to create really cute little things sometimes, even jewelry from some of the recycled glass that she has. She, oh, and there's another website that's really fun to watch. It's called um, Curious Mondo. Are y'all familiar with it? No? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's called Curious Mondo. And they have a series of classes on a lot of different arts. They have one artist who does glass fusing. Her name is Sorinda Jones. And so she has done some really fun things. And they use, and then this Jody McCraney Rusho does recycled glass. They have stained glass artists. They also have textile artists and and um, something called paper pole. I'm not familiar with it. I, I get the impression it's like a um, cement or concrete or something. And they they mold things. They she they do metal arts. There's all kinds of things, and they will usually have a three-day workshop and you can watch it for free and the each each session of the three days is about three hours I guess so basically you're getting about nine or ten hours of instruction with with somebody showing you exactly how to do things and if you take good notes you don't have to buy the class but if you buy the class then you get a little bit extra um, like they'll give you their firing schedules if it's fuse glass or whatever and and some maybe an extra project or something in there but it's a it's a lot of fun now they used to run it during the day and then at night they would run it for free one more time like the same session but now you have to belong to their little mondo club or whatever it's called to get it for free at night but you have to watch it while it's there you can't video it you know you can't yeah i wish you could figure out how to save it but but if you miss it you miss it but those are a lot of fun. And if you get on their mailing list, they'll let you know what classes are coming up. Um, and a lot of things that I've done, especially like some of the Christmas things I've done, are I've, I've gotten ideas from them. And and she the Serena Jones spells it out for you. And so does Jody McCraney Russo. Um, can't think of anything else. Well, this would be the grand conclusion. <laughs> Any more questions? I'd love to, oh, we can do a look at the dots. Uh-huh. Is that the same kind of glass that someone would use in mosaics? In mosaics, yes. Yeah, but you don't have to use, like this, this particular piece of red, and here I pulled it out just a while ago. Mm -hmm. It's by another company, it's called Uroboros. In it, they also, Uroboros makes, makes some that's compatible with what I do. So, but this, this piece of glass right here is almost $30 a square foot. So you probably would rather use one that's maybe not not fusible, mm -hmm. you know, not compatible. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a lot cheaper. Yeah. They, uh, but you can, yeah. You okay. can do mosaics with it. You can, yeah, you can do, you can do stained glass with it. But I, there are just some, some glasses that are, you know, you just don't need to invest the money into it being fusible. Like if I was gonna do a mosaic though, and I had, a, you know, a little square of this, and I just need a little red. Well, I'd go ahead and use it. I'm not going to go buy a whole piece for that. Um, you also can do a lot of things with non-fusible glass. It's called non-fusible, the stained glass. Like even what you get at Hobby Lobby. You can do a lot of things with that if you only use the sheet you buy. You know, the one sheet, mm -hmm. which kind of limits you on what you're going to do. But if you're going to do something that's only one color, then... You got it. You know, if you want to do something with enamels, you can put enamels on it. You can do screen printing on it. You can, um, there are some, there are some, uh, I'm trying to think anything else. You could do some stamping on it with inks and as long as they're, as long as they're high fire, you can, you can use those. Um, if you wanted to make a purple plate and because, I, that's the one color that that the glass I use. There is not a good purple. Just if you love purple, you need to choose something else. <laughs> there is just not a good purple. There's a good there's a good purple transparent, but as far as opaque, there's not um, or opalescent. Um, 
But if you found a piece of purple that you really liked and all you wanted was purple, you could put those, like you could, if you had a big piece of it, you could cut it in the shape you wanted and put one on top of the other and fuse it together and it'd be just fine. Most of the time, not the iridescence, they kind of turn to chalk. Mm -hmm. um, but most of them are, are great. And they say that, I haven't tried it yet, so I may be able to find a purple. They say that um, since Oceanside has bought the System 96, Oceanside was originally just a stained glass and tile place, um, that they are trying to make all their glass compatible. So if they are, even if it doesn't have the 96 on it, then I may be able to find, you know, I need to go somewhere to a glass shop and, and uh, find the glass the color that I want and just test it and see if it'll work. And there's another thing to do if you decide you want to get glass, you should go to Harmony Stained Glass, right? Mm -hmm. Harmony Stained Glass in Pasadena. Owner's name is Joyce and it's where I learned almost everything. I took a few classes and I learned a lot online but I can't, you know, hands-on is just better than anything. Yes ma'am. If you have a transparent blue and you put that over a red, will it look purple? No. Mm -hmm. okay. If I put uh, green over green over blue, it's going to look brown, which is probably what you would get anyway, right? Mm -hmm. But if you put blue over red, not likely to turn purple. The red is really intense. It's 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 really deep. Um, let me see. I have a piece of transparent blue right here. Oh, I was going to show you something else I just started working on. Here it is. Um, the, uh, yes, glass does not, like this, it's, it, it's pretty intense. And the blue, or what would we say, blue? Yeah, turn through blue. Turn through blue, this is just a little square. But see, it's, it's pretty intense too. And when you put them together, you're, that, like that almost comes out black. Uh -huh. okay, what if it's a lighter blue? Though? It's a lighter blue? Yeah, like the one that's like on the, the parrot. Oh, okay. Oh, like, Trent, oh, like this blue. Okay. Yeah, yeah I've got some in here. Dig and it's just not coming to the right one. There it is. Light blue? That looks perfect. It does kind of, doesn't it? Uh -huh. I was just wondering if it followed the principles of it, it, they're, they're, they're not, you'd have to test it and make sure. Because once you fire it, it may not come out this way, you know. Um, but the but the idea is there. Like if I, and if I put this, let's try this blue and yellow here. You should get green. You should get green. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. And what I'm working on right now, I made um, just like a, a sun capture. Mm -hmm. yes. So you can see, well, I should have just brought this out to begin with. Yeah. So you can see how the colors, oh good, I did remember the right order. The other day I made a huge one. I took it to the gallery and I looked at it and I'm like, oh, well I was a little dyslexic. I put the orange and the yellow in the wrong place. But even so, maybe nobody will notice. But see, like if I put this red over that orange, it, doesn't change the color very much. The red's still pretty, pretty much red. It's not even a red orange, I don't think. Do you? A little bit. A little bit? A little bit. Yeah. I'm not seeing it, but. No, but if it was the red over the yellow, then it's the orange. Yes, yes, yeah. But um, like this orange, this is called tangerine here, and this is called yellow. And, well, it is yellow, yeah. But this is called tangerine, and they look almost identical. And, and cold. There's the tangerine. And I think this one's yellow. Yeah, I think this one's yellow. Mm -hmm. So you can't really tell. I mean, at first I thought, oh yeah, I can tell. But for some reason, I can't anymore. I don't know if my eyes have gotten old or what, but they are almost, this one may even be, yeah. And also it almost depends on which color's on top. And which color's on top. Because by looking at from the back, uh -huh. you get a different, Different. Oh yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I started making these and I had a friend who had to put his little cat down not too long ago. And I said, you know, 
I need to do something for him. And so I saw him not too long ago, and he brought me his the little the kitty's ashes. Uh -huh. So I put the kitty's ashes back here. If you use just a tiny little bit, I'm going to make one of these, obviously, with this. Anyway, so I put the I put her name, and I'm not happy with the name yet. I just used powder, and it needs to be darkened. It's not right, but. I just put just a little tiny little heart of ashes back here and then put then fuse this little yeah screen print on the front mm -hmm. and so then I'll make the rainbow thing she liked to sit in the window and look outside mm -hmm. so but that's a fun thing to do and I had not done it I you know I've never had my pets cremated so I don't have their ashes but I will my next one <laughs> can't wait can't wait <laughs> yeah no don't tell her yeah, yeah so any other questions? Time is very good. No, oh, I talk dogs. fast. Can we see the dots? Oh, the dots. Yes, thank you. And you know, I didn't even hear that thing beep, but I see it says it's finished. Finished. Well, it's been making noises. But oh, has it? It's clicked. It's clicked. It's it's it clicks. Clicks. But, yeah. yeah. It says it took, it's only, it says it took less than an hour. Okay, you have to come here because I can't leave it open long. I should have brought my gloves. Let me go get a towel and put on there because the handle's still real hot. And you have to you have to remember that every time you open a kiln, it's an adventure. <laughs> we'll see what we got. Okay. And the heat comes way out, so be careful.